Today I brought my Moab, and I call it a Moab. It's my mother of all Bibles, because I can't read as well as I used to. And this is all in really big words now, so uh, I'll even put my glasses on to help me out here. Man, I'm excited. This was great. God showed me so much through this message today. I had it called Spiritual Warfare, but I just figured out war. That was going to be the name of the message today. And it is going to be the name of the message today. Well, I need a bigger counter here. I need a coffee holder and a place to put my phone. Okay, so let's get started today. So we're in Ephesians, as you know. But for some reason, uh, the pa other pastor said, you know, let's, let's just take a break while you're speaking. And we'll continue with Ephesians next weekend. Ephesians next weekend. So they gave me free reign. So I was like, oh, yeah. Christmas. I, yeah, <laughs> Christmas. But I said, no, I better not give a sermon on Christmas. But since we're going to be going back into Ephesians, I know all of you are familiar with the message of the armor of God, and we're going to be hitting that. I wanted to go into some things. Uh, as Christians, we should all realize that we're at war, especially once you become a Christian. We're at war. I hope all of you understand that. I believe all believers should be prepared for spiritual warfare. Too many times after conversion, we hear sermons that make new believers think that life is going to be carefree in Christ. And they're not taught the reality of what a Christ follower is up against. It's a constant struggle for a believer as Satan tries to keep you from carrying out what God has planned for you in the Spirit. So recently, uh, I was up and uh, I heard a sermon in an ex a big church from an experienced pastor, and his message was on the Good Shepherd from John chapter 10, verses 11 through 18, and then verses 28 through 30. And the verses go like this, 28 through 30. And I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Of course, these verses are comforting, but the pastor made no reference to the real struggle that uh, Christians face in the normal Christian life. And I say that because I was thinking about that, the normal Christian life. You know, some of us don't lead a normal Christian life. I didn't lead a, a normal Christian life for a while because I wasn't following God's will. When you're following God's will, you start leading the normal Christian life. And, and we have to consider that. Are we on the sidelines or are we actually in the game? Is Satan more worried about you if you're in the game or if you're on the sidelines? And so we have to examine ourselves to see in our position where we stand. So I want to go over today in today's sermon. The first part is going to be talking primarily about Satan, who he is, how he works, what he's done. And then the second part is going to go more into where our position is as believers in Christ, because there's so much hope in Christ. The verses I previously read are great, and they're scriptural, and we need to know those verses, but we also need to know the second half. So further along, that was John chapter 10. I go to John chapter 15 verses 18 through 25. And this is where we get into our struggles as a, as a Christian, if we're living a normal Christian life and serving God. In 18, it starts this way. If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know the one who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have sinned. But now they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates the Father also. If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would not have sinned. But now they have both seen and hated me and my father as well. But they have done this to fulfill the word that is written in their law. They hated me without cause. And in that, Jesus is quoting Psalms 35, 19, and 69, 4. And it gives you a good perspective on where you're going to be as a Christian when I was, first became a Christian, I became a Christian in the 70s. I was so filled with joy. I think people got annoyed at me. Oh, there's Craig. He's talking about Jesus again. Because you have that joy in you. Then later on, you're like, oh, I'm going through some struggles. 
I'm trying to carry out God's will, but nobody wants to hear it. You know, it's like, oh, get away from me. I got to drink my coffee or something. You know, my parents weren't, you know, I mean, they were saved later, but not a lot of my family was going to church. So I started taking them to church. So my family was hearing about it. So I was doing it at home. And then, you know, you'd go to school and you would tell people about Jesus. And they're like, what are you talking to me about Jesus about? And so you start realizing, oh, this is going to be a struggle. As a new Christian, you need to understand that. And, and, and to understand that, we need to know that who are we struggling with? I like uh, Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. And he's talking about who the God of this world is. And he says in uh, Corinthians 4, 3 through 4, it says, And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they may not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. The God of this world is Satan. And we need to know that. We need to know who's down here and who's tempting us and what his position and what his plans are and what he's trying to do. We need to understand this so we can defeat the enemy. Remember the temptation of Christ in Luke chapter 4, verses 5 and 6? And he led him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, I will give you all this domain and its glory, for it has been handed over to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Doesn't that give you a different perspective on governments today? Doesn't it give you a different perspective on what's going on behind the scenes and who's really running things? It's not just the governments. Who's running the world? It's Satan. Why do we have this big problem right now in the world? Is it God? Is it Satan? We need to think these things through, especially as Christians. Do you now have a biblical worldview, or do you retain the view that you had before you were saved? Are you living in the new self or the old self? And how are you dealing with the enemy of your faith? Because you're going to have to deal with the enemy. The enemy's going to be there until Jesus comes back with his glory, and we're glorified. So let's look at who Satan is and how he operates. In the military, we call this intelligence. You need to know who the enemy is, how he operates, and all of this with Satan is in the Bible. And you have to be aware of your own view. Do you have a biblical worldview or do you have a worldview? Your worldview was what you had before you became a Christian. Your biblical worldview should be what you have now as a Christian. And uh, we're going to go into some of the Old Testament here, and it's going to talk more and more about Satan. And let's get to know who he is and what his plans are and how he's operated in the past. And then as we get more and more into Ephesians, as we get to the, the armor of God, you're going to know who your enemy is, not just how to fight him, but who Satan is. So we go to 1 Chronicles 21.1. It's the first time Satan is mentioned by name in the Bible. And it says, Then Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel. And we'll get back to 1 Chronicles later, but let's look at Satan in the book of Isaiah, chapter 14, verses 13 and 14. Verse 13 says, But you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God, and I will sit on the mount of assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. Wow. This is what Charles Ryrie says about those verses. He says there's five phrases starting with, I will detail Satan's sin. What is Satan's sin? Here it is. He wished to occupy heaven, the abode of God himself. To exalt his throne above the stars of God may refer to his desire to rule all the angelic creatures, or it may simply be another way to indicate his self-exaltion. North, in heaven, in heathen literature, indicated by the abode of the gods. Thus, Satan was ambitious to govern the universe as the assembly of the Babylonian gods supposedly did. He wanted the glory that belonged to God alone, and his entire goal was to be like the most high. Wow. Can you imagine? The created wants to be the creator. We're all created. God's the creator. I mean, can you imagine that? Trying to be God? <laughs> I can't even fathom it. 
someone who holds all things together. I can't, it's hard for me to hold things together. It's hard for me to keep these papers on here. <laughs> but God holds all things together. You know, he's holding the ink on this paper. He's holding my body together. He's holding this church together. It's just amazing. I don't have that ability. You know, when we're missionaries down south, we don't say, oh, this is what I'm doing. I cannot do anything without Jesus. And anybody who works with me, I tell them that. I said, we can go out and do all things, but if Jesus isn't there, it's not going to happen. And it's not for our glory anyway, right? It's for God's glory, whatever we do. So in Genesis chapter 3, this is where we get the beginning of, uh, the, of the way Satan works. In Genesis chapter 3, the cosmic rebellion of Satan comes to earth. Everyone knows the story of Adam and Eve and the fall. The story is important because it shows how Satan operates. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, we see God's commandment about the tree of knowledge of, of good and evil. 17 says this, But from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in that day, for in that, day that you eat from it you shall surely die. What was God's commandment, and what did Adam and Eve do? He put it out there for them. This is before the fall. He gave them commandments. They had a choice. God gave them free will. What are you doing with your free will? Are you following God's commandments? I can tell you, for myself, I got into a lot of trouble when I quit following God's commandments. It just brought one heartache after another. And, and, and then instead of beating myself against the wall over and over again, and, and going, why am I doing this? Why don't I just clothe myself in Christ and go, you know what? I'll submit to you, Father. And life got a lot easier. I didn't create as many problems, but I still have the struggle when I'm working against Satan and his kingdom. But, whoa, Christ is with me. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, those, that's so important. Okay, so Genesis 3, 1 through 7, I'll read through it says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, You shall not eat from the tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. But from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat from it or touch it, or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, You surely will not die. For God knows that in that day that you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate. And she gave also to her husband with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were open and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. Wow. You think there was a little guilt there at the end after they had done that? Eve was deceived. Adam knowingly ate also the fruit. They disobeyed God's command, and sin entered into the world. And we see its effects today. They believed the lie of Satan, but Satan didn't disclose how they would feel shamed and be separated from God after their sin. They put their own will above God's. Isn't this how Satan still attacks us today? It starts in the mind this battle with Satan brings upon us. It's amazing, right? So everything started in Eve's mind. The ideas. And what was the standard that God, God gave a commandment at the beginning? Not to eat from this tree, right? So there's the standard. Just like they had the law before Jesus came, right? Everybody had to follow the law. And now Jesus is turn, and now we have a new covenant. But you get the idea. The idea was the disobedience. And what does disobedience do? It brings dishonor, not just to you, but to also to God. And that's how Satan likes to work. He likes to go in there and destroy us that way. Another story in the Old Testament on how Satan works is in 1 Chronicles 21, 1 through 17. And this is a, kind of a long read, but I want to read through it because it, if you follow the story, it kind of follows even a little bit. And it's all about David. And, if, and before this chapter was written, if you read uh, on chapter 20, it's about the war with the Philistines. So David is scared, I think. He's scared of all of his enemies around him. The Philistines had giants. If you read chapter 20, you read about a, a giant that had... Uh, 
<coughs> 24 fingers and toes, six fingers on each hand, six toes on each foot. You know, they found skeletons of that. They found skeletons of giants that existed with that many digits. And can you imagine how big they would be with that many digits and how tall they would be? So David was coming, I think he has this fear about him. And remember that uh, somebody had just went over and defeated all these people. Does anybody know the name of the person who defeated all of them? Joab. So if you go back, and, and I'm going to read through 21, but if you go back and you read, read 20 first, and you can kind of see David's state of mind as he's coming into the census. So here's what... Uh, 1 Chronicles 21 through 17 say, Then Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel. So David said to Joab and the princes of the people, Go, number Israel, from Beersheba even to Dan, and bring me word that I may know their number. Joab said, May the Lord add to his people a hundred times as many as they are. But my lord the king, are they not all my lord's servants? Why does my Lord seek this thing? Why should he be a cause of guilt to Israel? So right away, he's getting a warning, right? David's getting a warning from one of his men. Nevertheless, the king's word prevailed against Joab. Therefore, Joab departed and went throughout all Israel and came to Jerusalem. Joab gave the number of the census of all the people to David. In all Israel, there were 1,100,000 men who drew the sword and Judah was 470,000 men who drew the sword. But he did not number Levi and Benjamin among them. For the king's command was abhorrent to Joab. God was displeased with this thing, so he struck Israel. David said to God, I have sinned greatly in that I have done this thing. But now please take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done very foolishly. The Lord spoke to Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and speak to David, saying, Thus says the Lord, I offer you three things. Choose for yourself one of them, which I will do to you. So Gad came to David and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Take for yourself either three years of famine or three months to be swept away before your foes, while the sword of your enemy overtakes you, or else three days of the sword of the Lord. Even pestilence in the land, and the angel of the Lord destroying throughout all the territory of Israel. Now therefore consider what answer I shall return to him who sent me. David said to Gad, I am in great distress. Please tell, please let me fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are very great, but do not let me fall into the hand of man. So the Lord sent a pestilence on Israel. 70,000 men of Israel fell. And God sent an angel to Jerusalem to destroy it. But as he was about to destroy it, the Lord saw and was sorry over the calamity and said to the destroying angel, It is enough. Now relax your hand. And the angel of the Lord was standing by the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. Then David lifted up his eyes and saw the angel of the Lord standing between earth and heaven. With his strong sword, his hand stretched over Jerusalem. Then David and the elders, covered with sackcloth, fell on their faces. David said to God, Is it not I who commanded to count the people? Indeed, I am the one who sinned and done very wickedly. But these sheep, what have they done? O oh Lord my God, please let your hand be against me and my father's household but not against your people, that they should be plagued. Wow. Do you see the deception here? Then Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel. What was the sin here? What was the problem? David was not relying anymore on God. He was relying on how many men he had to defeat his enemies. The Israelites wanted a king, but God was going to lead on himself. But no, the Israelites said, give me a king. We want a king. So they got Saul, right? And now they have David. So Satan had to have permission, just like we read in Luke at the temptation, for him to be able to, to tempt David like that. But he allowed him to tempt him. And David fell for it. 
So what came out of that? He went ahead and sinned. Even though he was warned at the beginning of the chapter by Joab. We have the same thought process. Satan gets into our mind, and then we act on it. And then we have to deal with the sin. And then I like that statement, but Jesus. And that's where we have to fall under God's grace, but Jesus. So we can, we can see here through Genesis and 1 Chronicles. And if you follow 2 Samuel, it'll be chapter 24. It's going to give you the same story, but a little bit differently. You can see how Satan is operating and that he is operating. You know, another thing that I reflected on after I read this was our own government. We should be praying for our government. We should be praying for our leaders. Because notice, David sinned, but it was the country that, that suffered. Just like the decisions our, our, our people are making in office now. The decisions they make can, can make us profit or they can make us perish. And what's going on? So we should be praying for people. Even though we may not agree with them, we should pray that God will somehow instill in them to do what's right. So it made me think about our government quite a bit when I was reading that uh, 1 Chronicles 21. And I encourage you to go back there. And if you want to get an idea of what David was thinking and why he went to the census, go back to chapter 20. And, and even chapter 19, where David's messenger is abused. And you can see what he was up against. It wasn't just normal people. They were giants. They were fighting giants. And if you read at, on, on uh, chapter 20, and it talks about the uh, crown of one of these giants was like seven pounds. Can you imagine a king wearing a seven-pound crown of gold with a jewel in it? Or a spear that weighs, I don't know, 20, 25 pounds? Can you imagine trying to throw a spear like that? That's how big these were. So David was in fear. But instead of turning to the Lord when he was in fear, what did he do? He, oh, I can rely on my own strength and my own army. I don't need you. Remember the walls of Jericho? I'd rather have God than a hundred men because God can do all things. And he tells us that. And he's shown that over and over again. But what do we do? We keep relying on ourselves. And I've done that before. I'm guilty. So I think that's a, just an amazing passage there. So if you have time, go back and reflect on that because you can really learn a lot about uh, Satan. Is Satan deceiving you now? The strategy Satan uses is deception. He targets leaders such as David. He brings shame and dishonor to God's people. Now, I'm going to go back to Ephesians a little because this is important too. Uh, the first part and the second part of it. So it's going to be Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. And so you, we went over this already a little bit ago. And it says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world according to the prince of the power of the air. And who's that? Satan. Of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. There we go. We're getting back to disobedience again, right? Among them, we too formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, guilty, indulging in the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. Ever since Adam, we've been children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Amazing. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one will boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Wow. I mean, this says so much. We shouldn't have pride. God chose us. We should have that thankfulness heart. The thankfulness that God chose us. You know, when I get to heaven, I'm going to go, I'm going to be like, oh, all of you are in heaven with me. This is amazing. And it wasn't anything I did. It was all Jesus. Jesus opens your heart. I can give the message, but for you to accept that message, you can lead a horse to water, right? But you can't make it drink. So you can tell somebody about the message of Jesus, but their heart has to be opened. But it's blinded by what? The ruler of this world. And who's the ruler of this world? It's Satan. We need to know these things. And we need to think about these things as we walk with Jesus so we're aware. 
And this is your story from where you came from to where you are now. And the Bible even tells us where we will be in the future. Know who you are in Christ. And I know who I'm going to be in the future and where I'm going to be in the future. And that gives me what? That hope, that blessed hope that I'm going to be getting rid of this body of mine with all of its flaws now. As I get older, it seems like my body gets more and more flaws. And it gives me more hope for my new glorified body. And I can't wait for that. And I'm hoping it happens before October. I got a procedure in October, and I'm thinking, Jesus, if you come and get me before October, that would be wonderful. So I'm not a date setter, but I have that hope, okay? So what has Jesus done for us with his death on the cross and our blessed salvation? And this is great. He has redeemed us. He's reconciled us. He's forgiven us. He's delivered us. He's accepted us. He's justified us. And he's even glorified us. And one thing that I'm happy about, and a lot of you people like me, if you get to that point where, oh, God, he sees me as this bad thing. When you ask Jesus for forgiveness of sins and he's living inside you, he sees you through the lens of Jesus. No one is worthy, not one. I'm not worthy. But because Jesus sees, or God sees us through the lens of Jesus, God doesn't see us the way we think he sees us. We have to have that biblical perspective on what God really sees when he looks at us. If he's forgiven you for sins, he's forgiven you for sins. You don't have to live like that. You don't have to live with that guilt. Remember the guilt that Adam and Eve had after they sinned? They were trying to cover themselves. Oh, what have we done? Satan never disclosed that to them, right? If you go out and you have a partner, and later on you have offspring and you're not married, Satan doesn't come out and tell you, oh, you're going to have all these issues later, you know? But Satan's going to tell you, oh, do this. You're going to like this. You're going to enjoy this. And sin can be enjoyable for a moment. And then comes the, the problem of the aftermath, right? And so we have to think about that. We have to obey God's commandments to keep us out of trouble. It's just amazing. We are citizens of heaven, members of a royal priesthood, adopted of the family of God. We are under grace, freed from the law, and filled with the Holy Spirit. Know who you are in Christ. Every day you should think about who you are in Christ. Once you understand who you are in Christ, you realize you can't be defeated by Satan. He's going to come up against you. You're going to struggle. But who are you in Christ? That's the important thing to know. When I first became a Christian, nobody told me exactly who I was in Christ. We went through these Bible studies, and it told me about being saved and, and the work of the cross and super important stuff. But I didn't understand who Satan was, and I wasn't aware of how I was going to struggle as a Christian, especially if you're trying to walk in the light of Christ and to carry out the kingdom. In Ensenada, you know, God has blessed us. And God has just given us so much love and hope and fellowship down there. Because we're up against principalities down there. We're walking in dark places. We're taking ground for Jesus in his name. The enemy's right there. And, and we see demons cast out. We cast out demons. We see people healed. But we don't have that fear. Why don't we have that fear? Because we know who we are in Christ. We don't have that anxiety. We don't walk away from a, from a situation or something we've experienced and have this sadness. We have this hope because we've seen Jesus work. And as missionaries, you can plant, but you may not see growth. You don't know what you've done. I don't think a lot of us will understand what we did on this earth until we get to heaven. And Jesus goes, look what you did for my kingdom. And you may not know it. And it can be something as simple as giving a girl a glass of water or helping a man across the street and saying, God bless you. And that could just restore his hope. And that could restore that little girl's hope in somebody when you give her a glass of water. Somebody cares about me. But you're doing it in Jesus' name, not your own name. You see, you get back to David. David was trying to do it in his own power. I'm going to defeat my enemies in my own power. And, and God didn't want that. God wanted him to have that faith in him. Still, you're not sure who you are in Christ? We're going to go back to Romans 8, 31 through 39. And this is something that you should go back to often. 31. What then shall we say of these things, to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for, all, for us all, 
how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather, who raised, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or pearl, or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I cannot overstate the importance of these passages. When Satan is attacking you, go back to them often for reassurance and encouragement. We do not need to live in defeat. If only Eve and Adam had lived under Christ's redemptive work when Satan was attacking them. They didn't have the knowledge we have now through the gospel. Jesus hadn't come yet when Adam and Eve was around, of course. And so we have to consider that. We have the knowledge of the Bible. The Bible tells us where we came from, where we're at, and where we're going. And that should give you hope every day. Find out your position with Christ. Know your enemy. You know, the military spends so much money just trying to figure out who the enemy is, what the enemy's doing, and what they're going to do. And that's called intelligence. And we have to do the same thing as Christians. We need to know who Satan is, how he attacks you, and what his intents are. And he's been working since before we were, we were here. He was here before Adam and Eve. He existed before Adam and Eve. And then he came in. Then it became a multi-dimensional war. He wasn't just in heaven, was he? He was down here with us. And he's still down here with us. And we need to understand that, especially when we're dealing with other people. How is Satan affecting the person? If you're trying to share Christ, maybe Satan's trying to blind them to you. Maybe we need to pray and fast before we go out. That's so important in the missions field. When we realize that Christ is the one who does things, not just us, we assist, we help build the kingdom, but it's not us. So we got to pray and we got to press or fast, and that's so important. And when we go into uh, chapter six of Ephesians, which is going to be shortly, he's going to talk about the armor of God, the next pasture. And when he does that, he's going to equip you as well. So as long as all well is with the equipping on today's message, you need to know who Satan is, what he's done, how he works, and it's all in the Bible. All you have to do is pick up his word and say, Jesus, teach me who the enemy is. Help me in my struggles in daily life. How is the enemy keeping me from doing your will? Are you in God's will? Are you on the sidelines? Don't be on the sidelines. When you get to heaven and you're standing in front of God, God's going to say, what? Well done, my faithful servant? Or is he going to say, where were you? Yeah, you're saved, but you, where's your works? You have faith with works or just faith? The works is so important. God has a plan for your life. God has something for each one of you to do on this earth while you're here. And where's your time? Have you percentaged out your time? What percentage of your time is going into the work of Jesus? Is it just Sunday mornings? It was for me. I used to sit and listen, and then I'd go home. The next Sunday, I'd sit and listen, and then I'd go home. And then I realized, oh, wow, Jesus has a plan for my life. He wants me to do something. Next thing I know, I'm somewhere else on a mission strip in Florida, yeah, and then later on, I'm on a mission trip in Mongolia. And you know what? When you serve God, you see what God can do. When I went to Mongolia, God did so many miracles that would never be able to be accomplished by me. You know, if you have a chance that you want to talk to me about Mongolia, I could go on another hour, but you guys probably want to leave today. But he's done so many miracles for us there, and he's doing that for us in Mexico now. With the people we've met, and the first thing we ask for when people say is, hey, what do you need? I say, we need prayer. Pray for us. Bring us before the throne of God. One of the guys on, uh, is going to be on our team. His name is Louie. And, uh, and Louie didn't know it, but uh, I called my old mentor from the 70s and said, look, we're doing this new ministry in Mexico, 
and we're going to come under attack from Satan. And I gave my old mentor three names, and I said, could you pray for each one of these people specifically, that they would have different things, discernment, no discouragement, and a will to carry out the will that you have for them, Father. And so I have other people praying for them. So if you're having struggles, or you know you're going to be in struggles, not only fasting, right, and not only praying yourself, but get other people to pray for you, because those prayers, they don't just stay here. They go before the throne of God, and God hears those prayers. And God may not answer those prayers the way you think. He has his own way of dealing with things. And God can take evil and make it for good. We've seen that before. The Holocaust was a terrible thing. Terrible evil took place. But in 1948, the rebirth of Israel happened as well. You know, I was in Okinawa for 10 years, and it was a terrible war. The battle for Okinawa was one of the most ferocious battles. In three months on that little island that's 77 miles north to south, two miles wide and 22 miles wide at its widest point, there were almost 200,000 people that perished in three months on that island from war. And that was terrible. But after the war, because of the people coming over to rebuild Okinawa, guess what started popping up around Okinawa? Churches. So all these churches came into Japan after the war because they were closed off, if you read Japanese history. So God can take bad and make some good out of it. And we don't understand his ways, but his ways are righteous and true. He knows the beginning from the end, the end from the beginning, and we don't have that. And that's why God wanted David to rely on him. And we should rely on him too. Take that weight off your shoulders. Take that weight off your shoulders that says, I have to do this. I have to defeat this. God wants you to put it on his shoulders. Jesus is there for you. And that's the hope that I live with. When we're down in Mexico, it's not me. God's already there working. We're just there to assist. So I'm going to close out here in prayer. Um, I hope each one of you go back and read those verses and learn more about who Satan is what his goals are, what his intents are, how he's worked in the past. And as we go more into Ephesians with the next pastors and the next services, you're going to understand more. And you'll see why Paul tells us how to be equipped to deal with Satan and his demons. And also the hope that we have through the words that he gives us. There's nothing that can separate us from the love of Christ. We need to walk with that hope every day. All right? So let's pray. Lord, we thank you, Father. We thank you for the message today. We ask, Lord, that you'll touch our hearts, Lord, that every day we hold your hand and walk. We don't walk by ourselves, Father. We ask, Lord, that you'll give us that joy, Lord, as we deal with other people, Lord. People we haven't even met, let them see that joy in us, Lord. Let them see you, not just me. Let them see the love that you have for us. I mean, you died on a cross for us, Father. How can we ever repay that? We can't. There is none righteous but you, Father. Let us try to become more holy as you are holy, Father. Let us affect other people, Lord, the way you want us to affect them. Let us speak words, Lord, that are going to build other people up, that don't cause strife, Lord. Let us think what we say before we say it, Father. Fill us with your spirit. Convict of, Lord, of any sin inside of us. And show us your will, Father, that we can serve you these short years that we're on the earth. Thank you, Fathers. We pray in your name, Jesus. Thank you for joining us today for the service. God bless you. You're free to go.